Have you ever noticed how some people don't want you to achieve your goals? It's like the second you tell them that you're going to be doing something, they seem to pop up out of nowhere and tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't be achieving those goals. I like to call them naysayers. Yet, there's lots of pressures on explorers and businesses today to have that positive impact on our environment, on society, on the world as a whole. And yet it seems to be a bit of a hindrance in achieving our own business goals. And yet it seems like, well, is that right? Should we be giving up our personal dreams of success, of that big house in the sun, of those big fast cars? Or is there a different way? Is there a way to be able to strive for the things that we dream and we want while minimizing our negative impact? Not only that, is it possible to be able to strive for the things we want and maximize positive impact socially and environmentally while we're striving for our dreams? I believe it is possible. And today, I'm going to share with you my journey to the North Pole and how that eventually didn't really satisfy me. I'm then going to share with you the journey that I went on to find long-lasting fulfillment, what it takes, and how each of us can have a positive impact in our businesses while having a positive impact on the world around us. I was a student at university, and I used to look out of the window dreaming about going to the North Pole. And many people, including my lecturers, used to say, wake up, Bywaters. You'll never get anywhere daydreaming. When I announced that I wanted to go solo and unassisted to the North Pole, it's like the naysayers came out of the woodwork. They said that it was impossible. They said I didn't know what I was talking about and that I wouldn't be able to achieve it. But even my friend said, you know, forget it. Why don't you just come down to the pub instead? <laughs> A solo, unassisted expedition to the North Pole. Oh, no, that's not the one. The definition means no motorized vehicles. It means no dogs, and it means no food drop-offs while en route. It was just me, by myself, on foot, with skis, with all the food and fuel I required for a 60-day journey. Here are some of the uh, difficulties, as you can see up on screen, that you'd face at the North Pole. Minus 60 degrees, polar bears falling in the ice, biodegeneration. And I'll explain a couple of those. Two which are particularly important as a solo, unassisted expedition. The first is that you're carrying so much weight as a solo individual up there that you've got all of your food, fuel and equipment that to make it past the initial pack ice and then head towards the North Pole is absolutely important. You've got to get there in a certain time frame. The second part is that you need to be able to have enough energy on your body to be able to actually make it all the way to the pole, as some of the expeditions found out closer to the pole. Pressure ridges, 145 kilograms worth of food, fuel, and equipment, minus 60 degrees, flesh that can fall from the bone in five minutes worth of open exposure. Most people had gone up with a single sled system. And when they would get to pressure ridges like this, what they found they had to do was to actually offload half the equipment, um, shuttle run, take that one sled with half the equipment all the way over to some distance at their choice in the forward, come back, pick up the rest, and then go and hopefully rejoin their previous equipment and then continue the journey. Now, for the first 15 nautical miles, it's much like that. You're constantly shuttle running back and forth. Now, through my research, I'd come up with um, a solution which I found only used by one other expedition. And it was a super, um, super excellent gadget which no one had thought of before. 
and there's another pressure ridge. That's what it's like with one sled. All of that equipment over pressure ridges is near impossible. I came up with a second sled. So really what that enabled me to do is when I got to the pressure ridges, I'll be able to take my equipment, unhook it, drag one sled over a certain distance, mark the way, come back, pick up a second sled, and be able to rejoin my initial and hook it up. Now, it saved me a lot of valuable time and energy, especially in the first 15 nautical miles mark. All right, the next one. The second part is that the amount of energy required to be able to actually do a North Pole expedition is absolutely huge. It's about 5,600 calories. Now, I'm just going to try and explain basically what, what that means without sort of giving visual representatives, but basically you're looking at 5,600 calories as a solo expedition, perhaps a lot more, 7,000. Now, research had found that the body can only absorb 5,500 calories in a day. Now, it doesn't matter how much you eat, the body would just excrete the rest. So you'd have a daily deficit of about 100 to well over 1,000 calories, which the only way your body can do that is by burning off the body fat, or even worse, once that's gone, to start burning up all of your muscles and biodegenerating. So expeditions had found this out when they'd got closer to the North Pole that they ended up being far too unfit to continue. And that's anywhere from 7 to 14 days. So it was a major obstacle that I needed to overcome. And really, how did I do that? Well, I decided, OK, well, we've got to do something different, because this is a major obstacle. So I would carry that extra 10 days' worth of food on me. Now, all of my trainers and my uh, mentors for the North Pole argued with that. You know, it went completely against all of their training. They said that, they argued that, well, I needed to be fit and I needed to be fast. And I shouldn't sweat, because sweat at the North Pole freezes. And when it freezes, it turns to ice. You end up getting cold, perhaps pneumonia, frostbitten, either death or emergency evacuation. So how was I going to be able to be fit, fast, fat, without sweating? What I ended up doing was uh, finding a way to... I actually got to my peak physical fitness, and then I started layering on those calories. And I did find that, yes, I did slow down a bit, and yes, I did break into sweat earlier, but I had to push harder and train harder. Nine months later, after all that preparation, training and hard work, I was flown out to Ward Hunt Island to start this expedition. Only two previous expeditions had tried going solo, unassisted, to the North Pole. And they'd had difficulties all because of this pack ice. One of the expeditions got to the edge of that pack ice within, 15, uh, within 21 days, and the other person got lost within the pack ice over a whole month. I think probably lost his equipment by offloading and unloading, and then needed to be literally just turned back and be pulled out. I'm proud to say that 10 days later, I stood at that 15 nautical mile mark, the first person ever as a solo unassisted expedition to have ever achieved that. <laughs> but the, the thirst for achievement and adventure, it didn't stop there. It was an insatiable feeling. Next, it was the Himalayan heights of Tibet, the pyramids in Egypt, the Mayan temples off in South America, that was non-stop. Some were successful, and others didn't turn out quite as we'd expected. Like the time we went off scuba diving, deep sea, on 16th century Spanish galleons in search of $30 billion worth of gold. Can you imagine? We found an anchor. <laughs> Yet, once the adrenaline buzz of all these achievements had died away, there was this, I was left with this unsatisfied feeling. I didn't know what it was. So I ended up going up to uh, the Himalayas, 
in, to study the Tibetan, ancient Tibetan culture. And up there, I found a northern part in India, now the refuge and the uh, asylum of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan administration. I met many teachers who became my teachers, and one person who became my master. Oh, the title's gone. Uh, this is the ninth Jetson Dumper. Absolutely incredible being. And the message they kept on saying while I was up there was that the aspect behind achievement, to actually feel success behind that achievement and to get that sustainable feeling, it doesn't come from just achievement alone. In fact, it comes from benefiting others, in the service of others, with the compassion a mother has for her child. Well, I didn't know what I was going to learn about achievement, let alone what the compassion of a mother has for her child. I mean, I wasn't a mother. I couldn't become one. And I had no children. Well, at least none that I knew of. And, but I heard that one thing which sort of really caused a major internal conflict for me was all of this. How can I strive for compassion and achieve all of my goals? It didn't make sense. But there's a great quote that in the greatest challenge comes the greatest learning. Fortunately, with that, I stuck with learning Tibetan Buddhism. And it wasn't until years later, while in meditation, that I came to the frightening realization. And really, even though I'd felt alive while striving towards my dreams and my goals, now this was all far gone. And there was nothing else. It was all empty. And in fact, the reason for that was because I'd had no positive beneficial impact on the individuals that I'd come into contact with throughout my journey. In fact, it was worse. I had a lot of regret and remorse for those individuals I'd unintentionally negatively impacted along the way, even though I was unaware of this at the time. And even more important, I came to the shocking realization that when I was at the North Pole and I had to be evacuated out, there was a pilot who flew in through a tiny weather hole in a 14-day whiteout, sacrifice, or not sacrificing, risking rather his life and his co-pilot's life to come in and save me out, uh, save me um, uh, out with a second-degree frostbite. Now, if you go up to the uh, website and you go and check for explorers and North Pole explorers, you will find all the names of the people who've been up there. But not one of them, not even me, can tell you the name of the pilot who came out that day and rescued me. And that's important. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a special thanks to one or two people who've helped me along my dreams and goals. And all of these people. And there's more. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to show them all up here today, but... You know, it's rare that we go through our lives appreciating others for what they've done for us. When they've sacrificed, when we've been the beneficiary of their giving in time, effort, support, money, to achieve our goals and our dreams. And yet the compassion and the selflessness this pilot showed that day, it's absolutely fundamental towards achieving this long-lasting fulfillment that we believe we're searching for in the goals that we're striving for today. It all starts with compassion, benefiting others, helping others, and truly benefiting others. If we can do that while working towards our own goals and our dreams, where the two cross is what I like to call diamond goals. Now, I hear some of you saying, well, 
how do I form diamond goals? Well, let me share with you. On one side, I think to myself, well, what is it that brings me alive? What are my dreams? What are my goals? Which brings that energy to me? Then I also ask, all those people I'm going to impact along the way, how can I help them? I then ask a second question. All those people I'm going to impact along the way, how can I benefit them? Now, if you know what that means, that basically means that I've got to go and ask everyone who I come into contact with, how is it? What is your dream? What is your goal? How can I help and benefit you? Now, you get all of those goals, and you get all of your goals, and where the two co-align at that apex, I call diamond goals. A lot of work, eh? Well, I'm sure most of you are thinking that, because it definitely is, if there's only one of you doing it. But that's where the third part is absolutely crucial. It's about truly benefiting people by passing this message forward onto others and looking for other people who can become part of this broader team who each other can help achieve their dreams and their goals while positively having an impact benefiting society and the world around them as they go along. It's this type of network, this team of mindful, compassionate, conscious individuals or mindful, compassionate entrepreneurs, or, if it's possible, mindful capitalists. It's about finding those individuals, bringing them into the team, and striving towards achieving those goals and dreams for each other, and having that long-lasting fulfillment of working for a broader team for a much greater cause. I still believe that it is possible to achieve your dreams if you're determined enough. But if you want the real satisfaction that comes from behind those dreams, those satisfaction that you're chasing for, then find compassion and ask the question, how can I help, benefit, and truly benefit others along the way? Thank you.